Some soldiers called this the worst rifle of the American Civil War. But does it really deserve that reputation? Let's shoot it and see. Hi, I'm Brett from PaperCartridges.com at the shop again today in beautiful downtown Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. And today we're talking about this. This is the worst rifle of the American Civil War. In fact, it was so bad, the governor of Ohio told the US government that he's gonna stop raising troops to fight for the Union if they're gonna be given these rifles. So I am gonna shoot it, uh, and if you're only interested in seeing me shoot it, feel free to skip ahead a bit. But if you wanna know why this has been called the worst rifle of the Civil War, and if you're willing to consider maybe we've judged it a little harshly or unfairly, I hope you stick around. Uh, but this rifle really was hated on by Civil War soldiers, and it has an awful reputation today. The problem, though, isn't really due to the inherent design or the lack of capability uh, with the rifle itself. It's more with how American soldiers used it during the Civil War, and most importantly, the ammunition that was being provided for it. So what is this thing? Uh, that's not even a simple answer. This started out, uh, its first life, you could say, it started out as a model 1849 Kammerbüchse made for the Austrian Imperial Royal Army. It used to have a different lock system on it. Uh, it used to have a tube primer, uh, the Augustan console tube primer system. Uh, that system, Manton came up with it in the, during the Napoleonic Wars, uh, so it predates the percussion cap. A little tube filled with priming compound gets smacked by the hammer. That's what fires the gun. So that's what this originally had. And if you want to see the gun fired with the original Austrian tube priming system, uh, Blosh over on the Cap and Ball channel has an excellent video. He has a beautiful original configuration, Model 1849. Definitely go check out his video. I'll put a link uh, down in the description. But Kammerbüchse... Uh, Kammer means chamber in German, and Büchse is an antiquated word for gun, or uh, sometimes translated as rifle. So this is literally a chamber rifle. And that refers to how the bullet got expanded into the rifling. And you might be familiar with the mini ball uh, from the Civil War. That's a hollow-based uh, projectile that expands when the gun is fired. The force of the explosion makes the bullet expand, and so then it grips the rifling. Uh, this rifle predates Minier's actual invention. So the Kammerbüchse uses an earlier system that was uh, developed by Henri Gustav Delvin a few years earlier. Delvin rifles have a chambered breech, uh, it's hence the Kammer in Kammerbüchse, and the bullet literally gets squashed down onto the chamber by the soldier who gives it a couple hearty smacks uh, with the very heavy ramrod. And the bullet used was called the Spitzkugel, or literally a pointed ball or pointed bullet. This was one of the first rifle projectiles that was pointed at all. Uh, one of the first bullet-shaped rifle bullets, you could say. So before these, you're really just using round ball. Uh, and the Spitzkugel has one deep groove that was used for tying wool string around it, and that string was lubricated with grease. And uh, believe it or not, that system actually does a really good job of keeping the barrel clean and uh, controlling the buildup of fouling. There's a special recess in the head of the ramrod that's approximately the same shape as the nose of the bullet so that you don't horribly deform the bullet as it gets uh, rammed down and expanded. And the Delvin chamber system first appears in the 1830s. Uh, the French use it successfully in North Africa. It does work, but by 1849, it's starting to get obsolete. Uh, the Model 1849 rifle is an improvement of earlier Austrian uh, Kammerbüchse models, but it's still using the old Spitzkugel bullet and the Delvin chamber. It's got that large 71 caliber bore. Uh, it's got the old-fashioned 12 groove style rifling. And by comparison, the newer uh, Touvenant or pillar breech, um, sometimes called carabina tige systems, 
those have been replacing the Delvin chamber uh, in most countries in Europe uh, with a pillar in the breech. So the soldier really only has to drive the bullet down with one solid smack, maybe two. Uh, and the bullets being used are even more aerodynamic. Uh, they're, they're far more efficient. Uh, an, an example of a pillar breech rifle is uh, the Danish Model 1848 TAP rifle which is definitely an improvement over the Kammerbuchse. Uh, but in 1849, the Kammerbuchse is still a contemporary weapon. It's very capable, it is surprisingly accurate. Uh, these were not general issue weapons in the Austrian army. The rank and file still had a plain old smooth war. So these were weapons uh, for specialized troops. And in the Austrian service, they kind of had a hard life. Uh, they're in service for many years, and they should have been replaced uh, by the model 1854 Lorenz uh, into the 1850s, which was a vast improvement. Uh, but the Habsburgs couldn't find enough coins underneath uh, Kaiser Franz's couch cushions to give every single soldier in the Austrian army a new Lorenz. So in 1859, when Austria goes to war with France uh, over the question of Italy, uh, the Kammerbuchse gets pulled out of retirement and is somewhat widely used uh, in the War of 1859, uh, which Austria loses disastrously. But by 1860, these guns are well and truly obsolete. Uh, and they, they're they old, they've been used pretty hard, and somehow here in, in the United States, we decide that these were the guns that Garibaldi was using during uh, the fight for Italian independence. So we've been calling these Garibaldi rifles inexplicably. Um, but after 1859, these rifles are definitely obsolete. Uh, the modern rifles that you saw used in the Crimean War, uh, in the wars of 1859, at Solferina and Magenta, they're all based on the Minier system. They've got a longer range, they have smaller bores, flatter trajectory, um, they're, the ammunition's lighter. Everything about them is generally um, superior to this, the previous generation of guns. So it seems that... Uh, the poor old Kammerbuchse has finally seen the, the end of its service life. And, you know, after all, no one is really going to be interested in these antiquate... Oh, look what's going on in South Carolina. <laughs> the American Civil War overnight created a massive demand for any kind of military small arms. Uh, the U.S. Army, in 1860, the U.S. Army was only 18,000 soldiers. And a year later, at the end of 1861, uh, North and South each have hundreds of thousands of soldiers in their armies, so they're desperate for guns. They need any guns. Uh, they'd send agents over to Europe to buy up anything and everything that they find for sale. And it so happens that Austria, in 1861, is sitting on all of these old, obsolete Kammerbuchses, uh, and some of them get sold, uh, but the Americans don't use the two block. And the Ordnance Department has to scramble to figure out uh, how are we going to provide two blocks for, for these guns that have been imported with the original uh, console lock. Uh, sometimes they're called German caps, the tubes that were used. But it was a logistics nightmare to source this uh, these primers for the, the original two-block guns. So it seemed like no one was going to be interested in buying any more Kammerbuchses and no one would be imported until some, shall we say, enterprising individuals uh, bought these rifles in mass surplus from Austria. You know, Austria is happy to get rid of them. Uh, and uh, the rifles are either converted to uh, cap ignition with the normal percussion cap, or they're just cannibalized for spare parts to go make uh, different, newer guns to sell to the Americans. Um, and uh, most of the Kammerbuchses end up being purchased by the Union. Uh, because the Confederates, the Confederate purchasing agents beat the North over to Europe. The Confederates bought up the first wave of the top quality guns. And so when the Union agents get over there, they got to settle for what's left. So some of the Kammerbuchses are in decent shape. Uh, and, and some of them have been converted uh, to percussion cap better than others. So this rifle, for instance, 
they did a really good job. Whoever converted this from the two block to percussion did a really good job. But others were not done so well. Uh, most of the conversions are being done by the, the gun trade in Belgium, which is like a cottage industry. You got little guys in these little gun shops uh, doing these conversions. And none of them have a real incentive to do quality work because there's not that specific of an inspection being done. The Americans need guns right now and they're buying anything. So just do a quick job, uh, slap a percussion, you know, a, a cone in the barrel conversion. Often you saw with these, just get the guns done, sell them to the Americans. And if, if they're crap, who cares? We've made our profit. So these rifles got converted and shipped over to the United States. Uh, and they got issued to units that were desperate for any kind of military rifle. About 26,000 of these rifles end up being purchased. And uh, most of them are imported pretty early, 1861 or 1862. And they, they go predominantly to the Union. And they're coming in alongside a bunch of other European muskets and rifles of similar calibers. No one really knows what to call these things and how to differentiate the Kammerbuchse from similar European rifles. So they're often lumped together uh, as 71 caliber Austrian rifles. Sometimes they're called Jaeger rifles, Prussian rifles, German rifles, and then uh, Garibaldi rifles. So when, when you see an arms return and they say Prussian rifle 71 or German rifle 71, we're, it's hard to know exactly what they're talking about. But imagine now, you're from Ohio or you're from Indiana, and the Civil War started and uh, a local regiment is being raised. So you and your friends go uh, run down there and you enlist. Uh, you're going to go put down the rebellion and preserve the Union, and you're excited. And you, you think you're going to get a mini rifle. Like, I'm going to get a Springfield, a nice modern uh, cutting-edge military rifle. And you would have read about those, you know, the mini rifle used in the Crimean War, the French, the Zouaves, they've all got these cool modern guns. And you show up and they hand you a Kammerbuchse. <laughs> this huge bore, big old clanky socket bayonet that it took. And it, it already looks like it's been through a couple wars already. And it's been crudely converted to percussion by some cottage gun maker in Belgium. This is not what you expected when you, when you enlisted in the army. So soldiers who are given these, they're disappointed right off the bat just because they get this instead of a Springfield. And unfortunately for the soldiers that do get issued these, the United States Ordnance Department has no capability to produce ammunition in 71 caliber for the Kammerbuchse. The only thing they have that will work, that is being produced, and there's quite a good supply of, is the 69 caliber Burton Minier cartridge, which is used in the, in the rifle version of the Model 1842 and some earlier uh, 69 caliber U.S. arms that got converted uh, to being rifled muskets. So that's what's going to the troops, 69 caliber ammunition. And the United States Army never had a Delvin chamber rifle. So the soldiers had no clue that you need to ram the bullets hard to expand them onto the chamber. That's a foreign concept. So the American soldiers get issued these. They get issued 69 caliber ammunition, and they load them like you would the regular rifle. And right away, everyone realizes we have a problem here. Because the 69 caliber Burton Minier will not expand into a 71 caliber barrel. So accuracy is absolutely nil. In fact, it's, it's worse than a smoothbore because the, the Minier will not stabilize. And so it, the moment it leaves the muzzle, it just starts to tumble and it flies off into space. It just goes into nowhere. And fouling starts to build up and then loading starts to get more difficult. And it's just a nightmare all around for the soldiers who were uh, given that ammunition for these rifles. It was so bad that the governor of Indiana wrote to the Secretary of War about the Austrian rifles. Uh, he called them of the most worthless character. And he said uh, he's not going to send men into the field with these guns. So the Ordnance Department goes back and they categorize all the various weapons that are being used in the Union Army into four classes. First class being the best and fourth class being the worst. And they rank the Kammerbuchse dead 
last. So the, they definitely would agree that this was the worst rifle of the Civil War. And it's down there in the fourth class of weapons next to flintlock, smoothbores, and brown bess. But there's still Union units that are stuck with these things. And they need ammunition that's actually going to work. Uh, the state of Ohio in 1861 complains that their soldiers with uh, the Kammerbuchse can't hit anything. So the Ordnance Department does a special contract order. They provide half a million bullets that are simply the Burton mini bullet that has been enlarged a few thousandths of an inch so that it will fit into the 71 caliber bore and shoot accurately. And the U.S. arsenals start producing them. Uh, in, in 1862, uh, U.S. arsenals produce uh, over 12 million cartridges for the 71 caliber uh, Austrian rifles. So finally, at least in theory, we have percussion lock that works for us. We have a bullet that now fits the barrel, expands, spins in the rifling, it shoots accurately. So everything should be good to go now with these rifles, right? Oh, not so fast because the U.S. Burton bullet relies on the explosion of the gunpowder to expand the ball. And the Austrian system, of course, the Spitzkugel gets expanded by the soldier just wailing away on it a few times with the ramrod. So the Spitzkugel cartridge uses a lot less powder. It uses about 60 grains of powder. Uh, and the recoil is still fairly stout with that. But the U.S. Burton-style bullet will not expand with just 60 grains of powder. It needs a heavier charge. It needs 75 grains of powder to expand. So the Union cartridges are bumped up to 75 grains. And by the way, the bullet weighs 750 grains. So you've got a 750 grain bullet over a 75 grain powder charge. And if you know anything about black powder shooting, you're probably wincing because you know what that's going to do to your shoulder. The recoil from that is absolutely massive. The counterbuxa is not a very heavy gun either. So the recoil just goes right into your shoulder. And just shooting the 60 grain Spitzkugel load, you know, it, uh, <laughs> it, it kicks pretty dang good. I can't imagine firing a 75 grain charge behind uh, a 750 grain Burton bullet. And I'm not even going to try to subject this 175 year old rifle to that kind of shot. And that is why Civil War soldiers hated the Model 1849 Kammerbuchse. And it's always made me curious in, in my research into Civil War guns, uh, this Austrian rifle that everyone keeps hating on, is it really as bad as they say it is? And I'm interested in the historic context of things. And something in the back of my mind is telling me it doesn't make sense that a rifle designed from 1849 can really be that horribly bad. So I thought I need to do some experimental archaeology and shoot the Kammerbuchse with the original Spitzkugel Austrian military load and the American version with the 69 caliber uh, ball. So that said, it is time to go to the range.
Jeez, this thing makes some big holes in paper. Uh, these are the first five rounds of the Spitzkugel uh, standing offhand and perfectly adequate accuracy for uh, mid-19th century purposes. And here's seven rounds of Spitzkugel from the bench. And that's some pretty decent shooting for an almost 180-year-old rifle. And I have no idea where any of those went. Obviously, none of them touched the paper. Um, I brought 10 rounds of the Burton Minis to shoot. And then after shooting five, there is literally no point to waste any more powder. Uh, these things simply are not accurate. So as you saw, the camera books wildly exceeded my expectations. Uh, it shot 
point of aim, uh, point of impact right on at 100 yards. And it tore these enormous holes right out of the 8-inch bull uh, on my target. Pay no attention to the little 8-millimeter bell holes in there. Um, and I have to say, and I'm not exaggerating either, that the Kammerbuchs have shot better than the guy on the bench next to me uh, with an AR. To be fair, I think he was sighting in an optic, but still, uh, I think it kind of drives home the point that this rifle was actually very capable, uh, and it's quite accurate when it's used with the ammo and the loading technique that it was designed for. I did notice uh, a little bit of variation in the velocity and the impacts based on how hard or how soft I rammed the bullets. Um, and uh, the ones that get rammed harder ended up, uh, the recoil was a little sharper and the point of impact was higher. So they seem to have gotten a higher velocity. And the others that weren't rammed as hard generally came in lower. And that's one of the disadvantages of the Delvine chamber system is the accuracy of the gun depends to a degree on how hard or how soft the soldier uh, rams it. So if, if you use too much force, uh, the bullet will shoot high. If you use too little force, it's going to go low. That doesn't matter at 100 yards, probably not even so much at 200, but it will start to matter beyond 200 yards. But within, within Civil War battle distances, 150 yards and less, you're still hitting, a, a, you know, let's say a reb-sized target with, uh, with the original Austrian military ammunition. Uh, and it's the recoil stout. Uh, and it, it does take a few more seconds to load than it would a, like a Springfield rifle, uh, but it's still very capable. And as someone who's shot a lot of Civil War era arms, um, tens of thousands of rounds probably by now, uh, yeah, if I had to go into battle, I would definitely prefer an infield or a Springfield. Uh, but if if I was given the Kammerbuchse with the correct Austrian original ammunition, I don't think I would feel woefully inadequate. Um, I would definitely take it over any smoothbore, and I'd probably pick up the first infield or springfield that I found, but uh, it, it would do the job. Uh, I don't think any commentary is needed on the 69 caliber Burton bullets, which uh, I, I might as well have saved uh, saved time and just thrown them into the trash. They did not hit anything. Uh, it must have been very, very frustrating for soldiers that that had these rifles and they get issued that 69 ammunition. Um, you know, if that was me, I would hate this gun too. <laughs> uh, you, you can't hit anything, but uh, we know now that it wasn't really the gun's fault. Uh, the, the original Austrian rifle with the original Austrian ammunition shoots surprisingly accurately. Uh, so the next time you hear someone talking about how terrible the Garibaldi rifle was, uh, you can hop right in and say, well, uh, actually, <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I'd uh, appreciate a like and subscribe. And, uh, I will see you next time.